Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up, everybody? God bless you as you do. I'm still waiting for those who have a lumbago to get up. Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes. Say this after me. I will preach the gospel. I will sing the gospel. I will teach the gospel. With all of my life. And throughout all my days. Will you do that? Will you do that? Take those words to the Lord in consecration and prayer. Just tell the Lord, I, whatever others do, I will preach. I'll preach the gospel. No other thing to do. This is your life. Don't ever forget that song. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will preach the gospel. I'll sing it to you. I'll sing the gospel. I'll teach the gospel. With all of my life and throughout all my days. Tell the Lord. The Lord will see you through all the grace we need, all the strength we need to do it. The Lord will grant unto us and he give you success as you do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we come before you and we come with the little life we have and we lay it on your altar. And Lord, we promise you helping us, heaven supporting us, your promises and your power energizing us, we will preach the gospel. Lord, our singers who are here from these few states and all our singers all over at the headquarters and the whole of Africa, they will sing the gospel to save souls in Jesus' name. All of us together united will teach the gospel. Multitudes will be turned unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see now. Write your word indelibly, indelibly in every heart in Jesus' name. That nothing will ever erase it out of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And the ministers of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to a very, very important subject today. At this time in our Bible teaching, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. And we're reading from verse 16. That is the first part of verse 16. And then we launch into verse 18 but rise and stand upon thy feet for I have appeared to thee unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness verse 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That verse 18 gives us what is called a mission statement a mission statement a mission is very important and a mission statement is very important in every important significant company that is raised up in this world in which we live any of those managers directors and leaders of those companies will tell you if there is anything very important, it is what is called the mission statement. I met one of them some years ago. Went to attend a conference. 
And as we attended the conference, they wanted to know if there were those of us attendees, those who were participating in that conference that needed some discussion with some of these leaders who are giving seminars and also taking plenary sessions. They called it counseling session. I didn't know what I was going to get, but uh, the Spirit of God put it in my heart. I should line up and see any of those people. And then I signed my name. I wanted some counseling. And then the person they sent me to happened to be uh, somebody, yes, a Christian, yes, a minister, but not a full time minister. It was um, part time ministering, but he was fully in the board of directors of coca-cola and he was one of the originating leaders that brought up coca-cola in atlanta georgia in america and he invited him to that conference to come and talk about goal setting and about planning and about execution of planning and so the lord so worked it out they sent me to him and then he questioned me, I went through some preambles. After those preambles, then he said, why are you here? After he knew that the church at that time was in Lagos alone, were more than 7,000 people. And he felt that was a large church already. And so what do you need counseling for? I said, I, you know, then I gave him what I now call a mission statement. He said, that's right. He said, give me a chance. Then he went to tell the people organizing the counseling to cancel all the other people that will come. That he will be able to, that he will not be able to finish with me for even that session. And we had two sessions together. And later he sent me some materials that he had developed. But he told me something. He said, if you're going to achieve what you have in mind, he said, the number one thing you should think about is your mission statement. And he told me Coca-Cola has mission statement. And he told me this is the mission statement of Coca-Cola. That they want to get Coca-Cola all throughout the world. And that anybody they hire must sign into that mission statement that they will not want anybody in the organization that will not know that will not learn that will not accept that will not believe that will not devote himself unto that mission statement he said you accept you agree with that mission statement you are hired but then he said they keep on watching their people anyone deviating from that mission statement they fire that means they show him the way out and at that time i understood a little and but now since i've read so much about things like that now i understand better a mission statement when God called Paul the Apostle, he gave him a mission statement. And when God calls a minister, and when God appoints, anoints, and chooses a person in the language of that man, when he hires, then he makes you to know the mission statement. But then, as you, if you go away from that mission statement, you are fired. That means God says, I'm sorry, Saul, you've forgotten the mission statement. I'm going to find another man, David, who will do according to my pleasure. You see, it's all about the mission statement. And here is the mission statement that God gave to Paul the apostle. He said, here is what I give you to do. No other thing will you concentrate on. Open their eyes and turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and also receive an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith in Christ how important is a mission statement how important is a mission statement one a mission statement determines your priority 
it shows what you are going to concentrate on you're looking at the mission statement every time you say hey this is the priority number two it also determines your preoccupation your preoccupation the thought of your heart the thought in your mind the passion in your soul the drive in your spirit and the thing that moves you your preoccupation it is the mission statement that determines number one your priority number two your preoccupation number three your programs when you want to raise up a program before you put your hands into anything and before you spend so much money putting the programs where you ask yourself will this program contribute to the effective production or effective fruitfulness of our mission statement and if it will not contribute to doing and to achieving and to accomplishing the mission statement you scrap it the thing might be good the same might be normal the same might be all right but it's not going to contribute to the mission statement therefore it's unnecessary and then number four it also determines your preparation or training for ministry preparation or training for ministry now you're going to find out if you have not found it out already many churches have what they call theological school and when you're going to have a theological school uh, for you if you want recognition from the country in which you are the uh, country in which you are will say in your curriculum in that as you are preparing your ministers and as you are preparing the people that are getting ready for ministry training them they say if the country is going to allow you to have this and you're going to and you want us to grade your institution up to this level in comparison with all the other institutions of learning then you must have this in your curriculum you must have this in your curriculum comparative religion and then this other religion and this other religion and then in your intake of students there must be no discrimination you must be able to take students from here and there and there and then there must be no discrimination against the physically challenged the handicapped so everybody must be able to come in now in your preparation and training for ministry if you want to then establish an institution and you want the government of your country to accept it then they say you must put this in place and put this in place and put this in place most churches will just say yes sir and then you go ahead and do it we will ask ourselves all right this is what the country is saying and this is what the country is saying you must put together if they're going to approve this and you ask yourself if we bring in the study of hinduism and the study of islam and the study of this and that and then we bring in the critical examination of the text of the scripture and we bring in the study of greek and latin and the ancient languages and bring in contemporary studies and those seminaries they spend little time on the real bible if we do that how eventually does it contribute to the mission statement you see mission statements determines everything number one the priority it determines that number two the preoccupation number three it determines the prepa the programs number four the preparation number five your preferences preferences that means the choice it's a mission statement you see there are ministers that just get up into ministry and they don't think about the mission statement and they don't think about the purpose for which you are, you are called the lord said unto paul for this reason for this purpose i have appeared unto you and it is to open their eyes preferences preferences that church i see there billboard i see it there and bills i see all this and all that even the kind of a thing we put on our handbill on our banners 
it must tally, it must agree with her mission statement. When people are coming in here, they know that this church, this is what we are for. It is to open their eyes and it is to turn them from the power of darkness unto light. It is to give them an inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith in Christ. Our handbills, our programs, and the things we do must reflect our mission statement. And then, number six, our pattern of ministry. A pattern of ministry. Have you noticed the difference between this church and many other churches? The kind of music we have in our church is different. And the time we give to this, this, and that. What comes first? What comes second? What comes third? And the time we give to taking offering. Have you noticed that in some churches, they take more time, and singing takes a lot of time. Giving offering takes a lot of time, and preaching takes what? A little time. That reflects their mission statement. And then, deeper life, deeper life, I'm sorry for, you know, a few congregations, you know what they do? They save the time of taking offering till the last. The singing is gone, the preaching is gone, the prayer is gone, and then the minister comes up and he says now, because he thought that many people did not come, during the time of singing many people did not come during the time the bible study was being uh, transmitted to us and now that the people have come if you didn't miss the if you didn't meet the preaching at least well get your money before you go and so don't go yet we're not through yet yes bible study has finished now if you brought a gift to the lord that shows your understanding of your mission statement. Your mission statement, the preaching of the word is a climax. And the praying to sink in, to soak in, and to receive that word in your spirit. And then to go out without anything between you and the fulfillment of the word. That is the priority. And after the preaching of the word, you don't do any other thing that will lower the standard of what you have heard. You see, all the arrangement of the things we put together, we have thought through. And we have thought about our mission statement and the things we are called to do before we put all those things together. And you don't want to go and change all that. Number seven, it determines our partnerships. Our partnerships. You're going to find, for example, I told you about, told you about Coca Cola. And you're going to find Coca Cola has partnership with Seven Up or Sprite overseas and uh, why do they do that they are similar similar a uh, similar mission statement and uh, seven up is going on there coca-cola is going on there and they can change uh, you know they can change the bottle and they can and diet coke and this other kind of coke but the mission statement is there and if they're going to have any partnership they're going to have partnership with the people that have similar, similar mission statement. And then you're going to find out something about Coca-Cola. They do not allow different countries to change the ingredients of Coca-Cola. What they started with in Atlanta, Georgia, they protect all the ingredients. It comes to your country. And it is still Coca-Cola. In fact, you'll be surprised. They've carried it to this point. Go to a French-speaking country. And instead of writing, enjoy Coke. The way they normally write it. Instead of saying that in French, they say it in English. They just feel that this is Coke. And this is Coca-Cola. And anywhere you, see, anywhere you see that logo, that logo remains the same. And if they can do that, and they protect that product, and they protect it so much that everywhere it is the same thing, and they do not think that there's anywhere that Coke will not get to, they believe it will get to every part of the world, but how about the gospelers, the preachers? Are we taking it everywhere, and are we keeping the brand? 
the way it is are we changing it from country to country from state to state from region to region from northwest to northeast and middle belt and southwest and southeast and south south are we changing what God has given us when you know the mission statement you want to keep to the mission statement and you only come into partnership with the people that agree with that mission statement number eight the mission statement also determines our peculiarity our peculiarity that's why we're not ashamed to be who we are the other people can stay the way they are but we know what we're after we have a mission statement and it is that mission statement that makes us to know here is the way she go here is the thing to do here is the thing to preach and here is how to preach it it determines our peculiarity and that's why uh, whatever other people are doing you know uh, the, the mission statement is not to gather crowd do you see here that statistics is not here in this verse 18 numbering counting is not here in this verse 18 the counting will take care of itself the multitude will take care of itself and so we are not comparing numbers that that church is this big and then we are this small and then to be able to meet up with them and have the same number then we need to do this and do this and copy what they are doing the number the statistics the counting is not part of the mission statement just do what the Lord has called you to do and then the numbers the multitude will take care of itself we're peculiar we're, we're going to remain peculiar I said we'll remain peculiar now we're looking at Exodus chapter 19 verse 5 Exodus 19 and I'm reading from verse 5 now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be tell me a peculiar treasure unto me a peculiar treasure it's not something we want to shy away from it's not something we want to dodge it's not something we're afraid of it's not something anybody will make us ashamed of we're peculiar yes thank you very much we're peculiar our mission statements determines our peculiarity in first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 9 here yeah, it says but she a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation what's next a peculiar people a peculiar people we have a mission statement and the mission statement leads us to be peculiar that ye should show forth the praise of the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light now we're going to divide the message to three parts number one a clear perception of the mission a clear perception of the mission you have a mission you have a mission statement and you want to have a perception an understanding of that mission number two a compelling priority of ministry a compelling priority of ministry number three a consistent proclamation of the message a consistent proclamation of the message number one Tell me number one. You say, but you have it in your notes. Why are you asking us? Because I know some people don't write. And to test you whether you are writing or not, that's why I check up. And thank God you are writing. I said you are writing. And now we're looking at a, a clear perception of the mission. Clear, clear, clear perception of the mission. We're looking at John chapter 3. John chapter 3 We're reading from verse 17 For God sent not his son into the world To condemn the world That's going to determine What you do How you do it How you communicate How you profess 
how you preach, how you proclaim, where you go, what you do. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, what? Might be saved. Now, brothers and sisters, know your mission. I know the mission statement. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you listen to some other preachers. Maybe you just come across them one way or the other. And if you have met these or some preachers before, especially outside this country, some of those preachers, I'm telling you, they can communicate. I remember the first time I listened to Jimmy Swaggart before he had this problem. That man communicates. But in his communication, he knocks the government of his country and knocks this and knocks that. And then he does that and he takes joy in that. And he does it in such a way that he gets the American congregation, gets them excited, hilarious. And if you are not careful when you see that, you say, you want to pattern your preaching after that. But here is what Jesus said. He knew why the Father had sent him. And the Father had not sent him to condemn, but to save, to save the world. And so you see, everything you do and the style you have will be determined by the understanding of the mission statement that you have. We're looking at chapter 4 of John. John chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 34. John chapter 4 verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work again, that shows the uh, thirst and the passion and the desire and the concentration, consecration that he had. He knew the mission, he understood the mission, and he said, I am focusing on the mission. Chapter 6 of John, John chapter 6, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they will come and take him by force and make him what? A king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now he had already said the father sent him that the world might be saved. In his first coming, he was not to come and reign. He was to come and preach and turn and call sinners unto repentance. And now the people, instead of allowing Jesus Christ to remain, to concentrate and to focus on the ministry that God had given him, they wanted to force him to be a king. And how many people today will justify that and justify the acceptance of chieftaincy title and say, it means that they recognize my worth and they recognize my value and they recognize my contribution to this community. Jesus Christ understood his mission. And because of the understanding, because of the perception of that mission, he went away from them. We're looking at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And we're looking at it from verse 42 to verse 43. Luke chapter 4 verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him. And stayed him that he should not depart from them. They said, stay here. We enjoy the miracles. We appreciate the ministry. And we love the output. Stay here. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Other cities also. Other cities also. Then he said, For therefore am I sent. You understood the mission. You understood the mission. 
Success in one place will not tie him down. Success in one place will not close his mind to the reality of the mission that the Lord had called him to. That the Father had appointed for him. You must understand the mission. And know the mission statement. Because that is going to determine what you do and how you do it. We're looking at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'm reading it from verse 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Isn't that a wonderful thing that in that community, Jesus Christ had made so much impact? And the great impact that he made in that community made all men there to be seeking for him. If you didn't know your mission statement, and if you didn't know the extent, the largeness of where that mission statement was to cover, you'll be so happy. Is it is so great and so commendable that these people appreciate what I have and what I brought to them? All men seek thee, they're seeking for thee. Then it says in Bastati, in Bastati 8, and he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns. They're seeking for us here, they've got enough. Nobody has a right to hear it two times when there are millions who have not heard it once. Nobody has a right to hear it ten times, twenty times, a hundred times when there are people who have not heard it even once. Therefore, they have had enough and they have got enough and we cannot stay with them. Let us go into the next cities that I may preach there also for therefore came I forth. You must know that therefore why you came into the ministry and you must know the mission statement and that's the reason why you find that, that the Lord Jesus Christ did what he did and then he went to different places let's look at John chapter 17 verse 18 John chapter 17 verse 18 in John chapter 17 verse 18 as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world he said the same mission statement i have from the father not coming to condemn but to save that same mission statement i'm handing over to them i'm sending them just like you have sent me now you remember paul the apostle we're talking about him i want to show you something very peculiar about this uh, man of God and the understanding he had of the mission statement. Maybe you've read this and you didn't understand. I pray God will give us understanding. That helps you to set your priority right. That helps you to, to stop judging your church, your ministry, deeper life, Bible church, or deeper Christian life ministry. That makes you to understand why we stay where we stay. And why we do what we do. And why we just allow other people to do those other things that they know to do well. And are doing it creditably well. And we do not allow their success in those areas and the things they are doing. We don't allow that to shift us from our position. Because we have an understanding of our mission statement. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm waiting for you to open it, it's so important. We need to understand and God will give us understanding. I say God will give us understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17 For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Think about that. God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. As you think about that statement, isn't water baptism important? Of course, it's important. Do I have to do it compulsory? No, other people can do that. Isn't water baptism part 
of the gospel ministry. Yes, it is. But is it compulsory for the state of Osea to do that, to baptize everybody that needs baptism in the state? No. Other people can do that. There are many things that may be all right, may be good. If it's going to detract you and distract you from the major sin, the preaching of the gospel, you have to weigh all those things and then you have to put everything in the balance. And then you say, number one sin to preach the gospel. And then all the other things, if they are necessary. If they are important, you will delegate them to other people. And you'll say, this is important, get this done. This is important, get this done. This is important, get this done. But the sin that contributes primarily to the mission statement, you commit yourself unto that. And you know that there were, when we got started in the, in the ministry, Whenever we were to have a retreat at that time, because we were just starting, I wanted to show example to people, example of humility, example of availability that were available when our people go to court bamboo fronts from the um, from the bush. Then our state leaders at that time, and even me, our Bible study leader. That's what I was before I became general president. Praise the Lord. The Bible study leader and the state leader will follow us to the jungle there and the jungle there while you are cutting is pulling this and pulling that. And then we all do that together. What time then, if I continue like that now, to show humility and to show availability. If I continue doing that now, what time will I have for all these messages to prepare, all the messages of the retreat to prepare? And all the messages of the Congress to prepare, all the planning, all that we need to do. If I continue with that, yes, we we'll still have to do that. There are people that will do that. The point is now you look at the mission statement and you say, This is the priority, and this is what you ought to do that the Lord has placed in your hand that other people cannot do. Get it done, and then the rest of the things, if they are necessary to be done, will be given to others to do. The priority, the perception of the mission, I pray God will give us understanding. I come in now to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And you want to understand the mission that Paul the apostle received, and the mission that you too, that you have received. It says in Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. To open their eyes. That's why are you opening their eyes. Number one, to see the meaning of scripture. Open their eyes. That's the mission statement. Number two, it is to open their eyes to the personality and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ to the uniqueness of Christ to the salvation of Christ that's the priority number three it is to open their eyes to the riches of Christ in glory that they will know what they possess what they have open their eyes number four open their eyes to the responsibility of a believer not just that now i'm saved i'm saved open their eyes and open their eyes to their responsibility number five open their eyes to the reality of heaven and the reality of hell so that when their eyes are opened and they see there is an eternity and there is something waiting for them at the end of life, at the end of the road, then they'll be able to repent and they will live in righteousness and they will do that which is approved of the Lord. Open their eyes, open their eyes to the reward that they're going to have in eternity so that their lives will count now. Open their eyes. And if you're going to do that, you need to do that methodically. You need to study how to do that. And then you see a man that is totally blind to the reality of the Savior. You see a man that is totally blind to the salvation we have in Christ. 
You see a man that is totally blind to the responsibility of repentance and the responsibility of living a righteous life. You see a man that is blind to the reality of the inheritance of believers in Christ. You see a man totally blind to the destiny that is awaiting everyone. And then you take the time to open, open, open the scriptures that they might have understanding in all these areas. Open their eyes. I pray God will help us. I say God will help us. And if we're going to have any training at all, that is the training that is important. The training that is important. Preparing us for the ministry, for the mission, for the things that God has called us to do. In Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, I'm reading there from verse 40, from verse 27, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then in verse 31, and their eyes were opened, and they knew, they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart Born within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened unto us the scriptures, opening their eyes. That's what the Lord expects us to do, and that is the clear perception of the mission that God has called us to. And then we're looking at uh, that chapter, uh, still chapter 26 of Acts. Chapter 26 of Acts, verse 18. And to turn them. And to turn them. And to turn them. If the preaching does not turn people, if it doesn't transform people, if it doesn't move them and shake them and turn them from facing this direction to facing this other direction, then we do not understand our mission statement. If the preaching, if the program, if the things we do do not make people to move out of and then into another scene, then we have not effectively done the thing that is required in the mission statement. It must turn them. They must forsake something so that then they embrace another thing. They must leave darkness and then come to the light. They must leave sin and come to righteousness. It must turn them to turn them from darkness to light and to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. Now, let's look up for a moment, brothers and sisters. Sometimes when you understand the Bible, where people are laughing and very happy and joyful, you are sad, you are sad. You know, sometimes uh, they tell us that, you know, God is doing great things in Africa. Because, you know, this crusade is going on there. And this crusade is going on there. And this crusade is going on there. They say God is blessing Africa. And they say even those who write, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, things, they call church growth materials. They say you want to know how the church will go. Go to Africa and learn. And sometimes when I go into their midst, uh, they say, uh, are you not happy you're an African because now God is facing Africa? And he tells us that, you know, thousands, thousands are coming, millions are coming to the church. And he's, they tell me that they hear of a particular, and uh, they saw a particular program on the internet, and millions and millions and millions of Africans, they're receiving the Lord, and they're saying, we praise God for Africa. What do you think? They ask me. I said, I don't want to talk. I reserve my comment. They don't see what I see. What do you see? In all the places they go, honestly, honestly, are their eyes opened? open to Christ, open to the danger of sinning, open to the salvation we have in Christ, open to the possibility of the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb, open, open to the life of righteousness. I don't think they see, I don't think they see, I don't think they see. In all the places they go, and all these great, great evangelists, and they draw all these crowds. And if you want to receive Jesus as your personal savior, raise up your hand and 
Millions of people raise up their hands. It's not the raising of the hand. I'm looking for the mission statement to turn them from darkness unto light. Honestly, all these millions of people raising up their hands, are they turning from darkness to light? From sin to righteousness? Are they being called out of sin unto righteousness? Are they repenting? Do we see in our cities where they have had those crusades? Do we see in our churches where they have had those crusades and they say we should be partners with them? And that we should even be in charge of counseling when we go to follow after those people. Do they come? Do they respond? Are they turned from darkness unto light? You see, that's what a Bible based believer will be thinking about. How we are following through on the mission statement, my brothers and sisters, if you are relaxing and sitting back and saying that, well, thank God now we don't have to do too much because many other people are doing it. What are they doing? How many people are they turning to salvation? And what is the change of life? The transformation of life? Where is the new creature perspective? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are becoming new. Do you see that in your community? And is it a life of righteousness and holiness? Something very strange. Even after they have attended all those conferences and seminars and crusades and they come back and then they see you and you talk about the way of life and the way of righteousness. Isn't it strange to them? That's why you have a work to do and you will do it. I said you will do it. Because it says it's to turn them from darkness unto light and to turn them from the power of Satan to God. And that they might, they may receive forgiveness of sins. They may receive forgiveness of sins. I don't know how much interaction you've had with people. But you know, I've had a little interaction with people. And sometimes uh, when I'm available for counseling, they come from everywhere. And I ask them questions. And I say, uh, you know, if they indicate they are not from deeper life, I say, oh, wonderful. Then you want to come and uh, seek counseling here too. He said, yes. I said, tell me, where are you coming from? They tell me the church. And I say, are you a member? No, I'm a minister there. I minister like this. I do this. I do this. Then I said, can you tell me when you were saved? Oh, they will tell me the time they were saved. And then I said, I will say, are you sure that all your sins have been forgiven? Oh, he said, I still, you know, I still confess every time. I still tell God every time. Uh, the open sin, the private sin, the secret sin, and the public sin. And the one I know and the one I don't know, I still tell God to forgive me. I say, so you want to tell me you don't have assurance now that all your sins have been forgiven? Oh, he said, no. Can anybody be sure? They will ask. Then I will think a minister coming from another place. Somebody leading prayer, casting out devils in the prayer team, in the prayer bunch. And the one that is, some of them give their full time into doing that. And they train them to do that. And when they come and you ask them, do you have the understanding that all your sins are forgiven? And you have a clear conscience. If you die today, you will go to heaven. The assurance, the certainty is not there. That's the reason why we need to rediscover once again what the mission statement is. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are what? Tell me sanctified by faith that's in me and so then as you have a proper perspective of that mission statement then you'll move on and you give priority to that which you now understand point number two point number two we're looking at a compelling priority of ministry a compelling priority of ministry this is what drives us and this is what compels us. Brothers and sisters, can we look up for a moment? You know, um, sometimes, uh, are you looking up? I see some of you bending down. I said, are you looking up? You know, sometimes when I see your face like that, I know whether you're ready to receive what I want to say or not. So look at me and I'm looking at you. 
uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's very, very difficult for many people to remain peculiar and remain unique in the midst of many, many other people. Now, here is Leadership Congress, and I'm going to talk to you. Let's say, for example, we have all the multitudes here like this, but let's say we're not all deep alive. Let's say that deeper life, the proportion of deeper life is all the brothers and sisters, ministers were having hall one, and the rest of all the halls are occupied by all the other ministers. And here we have to preach, and they preach, and I preach, and some of our leaders preach. You know what? We want to be careful, not me, but you know, generally, if I'm going to preach my last message, I preach it, and then whatever you do after I've finished, you curse me, you lambast me, or whatever, I'm gone. I'm back to the headquarters. I don't care what you say after I'm gone. I will tell you the truth. I said I will tell you the truth. But you know, when we're all together like that, you want to be careful not to offend that person there, not to offend that person there. And some of the people that have married to us, not to offend that person. And some of the music, not to, not to, not to be accused of pride. That, you know, it's only deeper life choir that comes to sing. And all the other people, too, with all the things they want to do, they are there. Just understand one another. And how fruitful are those kinds of ministries? And then when you have everybody together like that, and you cannot tell the whole truth, but we can still get them together, and they will still come, and I said they will come, but then we take the center stage. I don't care what people comment, what they say. We bring the choir we know, those who are saved, and we know that our choir they are saved by the grace of God. And we're not bringing lepers, spiritual lepers, to minister to people, to other lepers. And we know that these ones are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And we know that these instruments are consecrated unto the work of the ministry. And they take these instruments, and whatever they know how to blow, they blow. That will be enough for us. Not to bring choir here, choir there, choir there. And we say this is the choir that will sing and then when it comes to announcement or whatever we just say the people we know that will not contradict what we're saying and their life their family their utterance everything is just like this we bring them on it will have a few people that will check out that will say if it is a deeper life thing then i'm going then we'll respectfully release them and the rest of the people waiting, they will hear something. I said they will hear something. Then we know we have a priority and we know we have a mission statement and we know what we're after. What we want to do is not the crowd. It is the impact and the effect of what we do that matters. And this year coming, by the grace of God starting tomorrow, we're going to do something. I said we're going to do something. And if God gives me permission to come to your stage, we'll join hearts and hands and heads together. And whatever I do, you'll give me a good amen when I come to you. I said you'll give me a good amen when I come to you. You will not be saying, look at our father and the lord he has come again see him we're not in deeper life other people are here and see the way he's talking after he's gone these people will knock us and they'll persecute us they say, hmm, deeper life deeper life holy holy people and then you begin to play some pranks and say daddy go so these people here they don't they cannot take in everything when i come i'll throw the bombshell and they are going to they are going to come and stay in Jesus name. Yes. Are you in agreement with me? Yes. Should I come? Yes. True true. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. You want me to come put your hands together for Jesus. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Quiet people, should I come? Yes. And you will see you play this like you are playing here, you'll play like that. Yeah. You see me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You know, we need to concentrate on what God has given us to do, and we're going to do it. 
this nation will shake. This continent of Africa will shake. Because the army of the Lord now we are getting up. The fire is burning within us. We are rediscovering our priority. We are rediscovering our commission. And this time it will be done in Jesus name. The compelling priority of the ministry. We are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We are looking at verse 2. For I determined not to know. For I determined not to know any sin among you, save except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You see that? That's the priority, the compelling priority of this man of God. And He said, This is what I'm after, only to see Christ exalted. This is what I'm after, only to see the glory of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ exalted and lifted up. And this is the only one thing to do, the priority, what we need to concentrate on. And that's what the Lord is telling us, uh, teaching us about Paul the Apostle. And we're looking at uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. That's a priority. You go anywhere, everywhere, and you reveal Christ as our Savior. Christ as our sanctifier. Christ as our healer. Christ as our power. Christ the coming King. And he says, when Paul the Apostle talked to the Corinthians, he said, For we preach not ourselves. But we're preaching Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. The concentration we ought to have, the priority we need to concentrate on, that is the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that the cross, the redemptive sacrifice, atonement of Jesus Christ has purchased for you, for me, and for the rest of the world. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see the concentration, you see the priority, you see the thing that drove this man of God, this minister of the gospel that he'll declare Christ in all his riches, in all his glory, and he'll bring him to the people, and whatever comes after that, therefore I endure all things. And I do that for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain salvation. That is the purpose, and that is the goal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Once again, can you say it with me? I will preach the gospel. I will sing the gospel. I will teach the gospel with all my life and throughout my days. I will do it in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 18 2 Corinthians 5 18 and all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that's the ministry has given us and that is where our priority ought to be point number three a consistent proclamation a consistent proclamation of the message Acts chapter 26 you are consistent about it you start, you continue you commence you continue and you don't ever stop and you do not allow the challenges of the day and the hardship of the time to ever stop you you know what the mission statement is and you know what the ministry entails and then you carry that message and you go to give the message to the people who are waiting acts 26 18 and 19 acts 26 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light 
and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me that is in Christ. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, tell me the rest. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. There is an heavenly vision, there is an earthly vision. And if we're not careful, the earthly vision will drive out the heavenly vision. But Paul the Apostle never, never, never allowed that. He saw what other people did, and he saw how other people carried on ministries. And then he even saw all that the people of Asia, Asia Minor, and all the Gentiles, all they were doing. And he knew what he was doing was bringing persecution to him. And he said, you know, if I wanted to avoid persecution, I know what to do. I'll stop talking about the fact that circumcision does not save. I'll remove that from my message. I just, I'll still preach Christ, but I'll compromise a little. And once I stop challenging the Jews that circumcision means nothing, it is the new creature that matters. Once I subtract that from my message, I'll be all right. And then when you go to Ephesus, where they say Diana is the God of the Ephesians, and he shout for two hours, and you don't want any, any doors to be raised. All you want to do is just, you know, preach healing and get them healed. And about the idolatry, you know, if you keep quiet, and don't talk about that you're not going to irritate anybody and if you go to a Jewish section you say what the Jews want to hear if you go to Thyatira you say what the people there want to hear and you don't bother yourself about Jezebel in Thyatira and once you do that everybody will accept you and you'll be like very popular but Paul the apostle said that's not how to do ministry you must still tell the truth and it is when you preach the truth where you're all your heart all your soul and you proclaim this message the message that saves and the message that has no compromise in it at all that is when we're going to carry the mission and then the mission will have effect in the lives of the people in the lives of those sinners we're going to reach in them calling them to repentance and they're getting saved and we see the change and the transformation in their lives the time has come we'll see that in jesus name a consistent proclamation he said i was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision i kept on doing it and doing it and doing it even when the challenges came i still stood by it i pray that god will help you you will stand by it as well in jesus name we're looking in at acts of the apostles chapter 5 verse 17 acts chapter 5 verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees and were filled with what? Indignation, wrath and anger and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. They put them in the prison. Those people suffered. If you think about suffering today, there is nothing compared to be compared with the suffering that took place in the early church. And yet, with all the persecution, with all the imprisonment, with all the pain, with all the havoc they did to those believers, they kept on. And they were consistent in proclaiming and publicizing that message. The Almighty God had given them to His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And nothing shut their mouth. And what an example for us that in the little, little, minor things, the light affliction we have to go through today. That we too, with real purpose of mind, and with real decision and diligence, and with real determination, and with a hand that cannot be denied or turned back, we emphasize the same thing. That the word of God has told us to emphasize calling people out of sin, bringing them to the Savior for a change, a transformation in their lives. They imprisoned them, but look at verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, The Lord will open every, every prison door. 
any challenge, any difficulty, any imprisonment, any persecution, any problem that the people of the world will bring, the Lord will open all those prison doors in Jesus' name. He says, I'm God, I change not. He has not changed. He remains the same, ever the same. And we know that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And those angels are still ministry spirits unto the people, the heirs of salvation. And because of that, we're sure that whatever may come, we're able to stand and the Lord will stand by us in Jesus' name. Now, when those angels, when that angel opened the prison doors, what did he tell them? Look at verse 20. And said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Don't retract anything. Don't subtract anything. Don't take anything away. Don't hide the painful truths. That will make them to stir. And that will make them to kind of get jolted. And want to persecute you. Give them everything. Go stand. And speak. In that same temple where they caught you. And speak to the people. All the words of this life. And when they had heard that. They entered into the temple. Early in the morning. And they taught. And we're reading now from verse 27. They caught them and they brought them to the, uh, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the council. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You'll think such a threat, such a question, will kind of intimidate them. That they will lose their courage, their purpose of mind, and they will lose their perception of the mission, and they will lose their priority for ministry. But no, you will not lose your own. In verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to be God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. You did it, and now you tell us after his risen from the dead, not to tell the people for their salvation. We must obey God rather than men. And he must God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and we are his witness of these things and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him when they heard that they were caught to the heart and took counsel to slay them could they slay them at that time never their time was not up yet and they had to keep on declaring what the Lord had given them to declare. And he had that priority of ministry. I pray the Lord will help us to keep on consistently proclaiming this message of salvation in Jesus' name. Nothing will stop your journey. Nothing will stop your ministry. You have started, you will continue. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verse 14. I am dead of both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is. I am ready. Are you ready? I am ready to preach the gospel to, to you that at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You will see here the consistency of Paul the Apostle. Then he passed this on to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verses 1 and 2, Thou therefore... My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same 
I will to change it. I will to modify it. I will to water it down. I will to dilute it. Like the dilute pine wine in your village. Tell me. No. The same thing that you have heard from me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Don't waste your time with the people that are not able to teach others also. Don't waste your time with the people that are not teachable, that cannot be trained. Get those people together that accept the mission, they accept the message, they accept the ministry, and then push the word into them. And when it works in their lives, works in their families and they have the conviction an unshakable conviction that even if they have to die for it they will honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints put that in their hands that same thing you have heard that touched your life that transformed your life that changed your life is that same thing you have to commit to all the people so that they too they will be changed and they will become change agents Talking to all the people, preaching to all the people, and leading other people to forgiveness and salvation and sanctification, a new life in Christ. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter four. I'm reading from verse one. I charge thee therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Will you? Be instant in season, out of season, will you rebuke, reprove, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables but watch thou you know many things in all things watch yourself watch your mind watch your spirit watch over yourself when you see that fear is coming in when you see you are exalting those sinners above your savior and when you see that the problem of the day and the pain from society is making you to shift away from the commission that Christ has laid upon you and when you see you are modifying the responsibility because you are trying to dodge the pain of persecution and you are trying to dodge the problems coming from the people watch yourself that you'll come back to where you started and you'll say i've committed myself i've laid my hands on the plow i've opened my mouth to the lord i will not go back watch watch thou in all things endure afflictions whatever affliction comes you're signing for that is part of the mission is part of the ministry and is part of what you have committed yourself to and your afflictions do the work of an evangelist don't leave it to people that do not understand don't have the perception of the mission statement to just keep on polluting the field and destroying the harvest but you do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry your will I said you will we are going to pray and commit ourselves and we're going to say Lord I've heard it again the mission the ministry and the message and you put everything in my hand everything in my heart and Lord I come to pledge my life my time my talent my skill my ability everything of God I make myself available Lord I will and through these mouths of mine and through these feet of mine and through this knowledge of mine oh Lord I will go everywhere you call me and the work will be done in Jesus name and this army of the Lord here we're going to turn multitudes in their millions unto the salvation of the Lord in Jesus name raise your voice to the Lord and say Lord I'm ready Lord I'm ready Lord I'm ready Lord I'm ready I will do it like Paul the apostle did it I will do it like Paul the apostle gave himself I will give myself oh Lord lay your hand on me lay your hand on me lay your hand on me I give myself as a sacrifice 
sacrifice, the mission, the ministry, the message, I commit my life. I commit myself. I commit everything of God. I will do it in this generation and in this nation and in all the nations of Africa and beyond. People will know that Jesus